<laughs> hey everybody, it's Ken Tucker here with uh, Changescape Web. Right. Today I'm joined by Jen, Ian, Dan, and Paul. And we're all really excited to have um, with us today, John Janch. We've worked with John for a long time. And John, I think you're the only guest now that's been uh, that's made our second appearance. So hey. thank you very all much right. for that. Um, John is the founder of Duct Tape Marketing and author of the upcoming book, The Ultimate Marketing Machine, Five Steps to Ridiculously Consist Consistent Growth from HarperCollins Leadership. And that's going to be out uh, September 21st of uh, this year. So let's just jump right into it. Um, John, this book looks a little different than maybe some of the other books that you've put together before. What new ground does the uh, ultimate marketing machine cover that's different from other marketing books out there? Sure. So this is uh, this is actually my seventh book, um, and and I I do need to correct you, Ken. I okay. make this mistake sometimes too, but it's the ultimate marketing engine, ultimate not machine. Okay. Machine. All right. <laughs> which, all right. Which I have been guilty of doing too. So it's easy easy to do, but all it's right, the ultimate. Apologize for that. No, yeah. no worries. The the ultimate marketing engine, and it, it is my seventh book, and but it's it's really the first straight up kind of marketing strategy book that I've written in about 10 years. So in a lot of ways, uh, what I've added to this book is, you know, I'm still practicing marketing every single day. So it's kind of my uh, evolution of uh, some of the things I wrote about in duct tape marketing and certainly in the referral engine uh, as well. Probably the, the, the number one innovation that um, I'm, I'm really think uh, uh, from feedback is, is uh, changing how some people think about uh, marketing is, is something that I call the customer success track, which uh, we can go into in, in more detail, but it's, it's a significant part of the, the what, what kind of big idea, if you will, of this book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's been really interesting to watch the way business has been morphing lately and, I'm, we're, we're going to get more into this as we as we talk through uh, throughout this session. But, you know, it it, it it seems to me like the idea of subscriptions and memberships mm -hmm. and all of that has just become hugely important. And so, you know, it, I'm really excited to, to learn more about your book and how you uh, how you came up with what you've got and, and certainly, you know, find out more about the five steps. You, you, you bet. Well, I, I will say that. Um, I signed the contract for this book, actually, March 15th, 2020. I'll just give you guys a moment to think about what you were doing March 15th, 2020. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? the, yeah. The world was coming to an end, uh, or at least uh, our, our, our little portions of the world, we felt that way. Um, and so, uh, you know, it really, I, I was kind of like, God, what am I going to write? I mean, it, right now, what everybody's going through, what I'm going through is is certainly going to you know, dictate this, but I, I certainly didn't want to write, you know, how to market in a time of COVID. Nobody wants that book particularly anymore. Right, right. Um, and, and, and so it, it, what, what I, what came to be the big idea from this book really is what I actually saw from some of my customers. I mean, there were some people that of course were in the wrong place, the wrong industry, the wrong time. I mean, they just, they, they really got wiped out even by COVID, but I also saw a lot of businesses that not only, uh, survived they, they actually thrived um and and it really shone a very bright light to me on something that's always been true uh, a lot of businesses uh grow and and scale just because they're in a market that happens to be growing and scaling uh, at the time but in tough times uh, businesses that that really survive and thrive are ones that are meaningful in some way some important way to their customers i saw a lot of of customers reaching out to some of my clients and saying hey what can we do you know we're going to be here with you. We know you've got to make hard decisions right now. How can we support you? And I think that that, again, has always been relevant. It's always been true. But I, I do think that the the struggles that a lot of us went through last year uh, just highlighted that for me. And so uh, the, this idea of customers or treating customers as members uh, came about not, not as a, I mean, membership as a business model is, is great, but it was really more this idea that that you know, how can we look at our our customers, you know, rather uh, through the lens of a transaction, and think more in terms of the idea of, of a transformation? You know, how can we look at everybody who becomes a customer and look at where they are today, um, and try to take them to where they want to be, as opposed to just try to sell them what it is that we sell? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All right. 
And so uh, I just just I made you speechless, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, wow. you you uh you did have a you were just talking about that customer success track, and I was wondering, um, why don't you unpack that a little bit? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Just you know, how might a business apply the customer su success track and right. use it on a regular basis? Well, so as you guys talked about in the beginning, I've worked with many of you, you've, you've worked with me for many years and um, the customer success track really came about not as something that I planned out and said, okay, this is, I'm going to break customer stages into, you know, it really came about sort of organically. I mean, I've worked with, uh, I've had customers that I've worked with for 10, 12, 15 years now. And as you continue to work with somebody under the umbrella of marketing, I mean, they mature, you know, the work that you do for them in a way matures. And so uh, it came, to, uh, it, it really seemed to me that there were kind of common breaks or stages as I called them. And so this customer success track or the idea of creating a customer success track for marketing, at least in this case, was that uh, to, to really kind of understand what stage Age, most of our customers come to us in or prospects come to us in what are the characteristics of those stages I mean how can we actually identify somebody in that stage what are the challenges we know or we've learned at least that they're facing because they're in that stage and then finally what's the promise if we could actually move them out of that stage to the next stage um, and each stage then has we have the ability I think if 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 our goal is to move a client to the next stage, we have the ability to create a list of milestones in each of those stages and basically say yes or no, you know, have they accomplished that or have we accomplished that for them? Uh, if the answer is yes, great, check that off. If the answer is no, what tasks can we assign then to that milestone? So it almost becomes a, a bit of a guaranteed way to move people through the stages, do the appropriate work in each stage. Uh, so they come to you in a foundational stage, we get them out of the foundational stage and move them to level up. Uh, then we move them to, you know, ultimately to, to scale. And that's the idea of, of actually going into the engagement with the goal of taking them from where they are to where we believe they want to be. And I think that this, uh, this thinking uh, not only becomes a roadmap for what we sell, but I think in, it ultimately can color the mission of the work that you do. It, can, it certainly can color the processes and the training and you know, who you even hire and your sales messaging um, around this idea of taking people on a, a guided journey as opposed to just simply creating a transaction. And it's it's interesting because this I, I've heard you mention this before that sometimes like us as marketing consultants as a result of the customer success track actually become business consultants a little bit more than we ever have uh, which is interesting too uh, it's you know we used to think oh gosh that's another lane or something like yeah. that but. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think now more than ever, it seems like we're getting pulled in that direction anyway, whether we like it or not, yeah. uh, to be that. Yeah, this customer success track is really, uh, a, you know, we can call it marketing strategy, you know, to develop this, but it's really overarching strategy for the business. And I think today, especially working with smaller, uh, mid-sized businesses, if you call yourself a consultant or a strategist, I mean, you're going to get into every area of the of the business because there are so many areas uh, that, that that impact marketing that we, maybe we don't think of as marketing, but we probably should. And I think that that's, that's really the idea. Now, the, this customer success track, I mean, ultimately what I want to try to do with this or my goal of, of publishing it in this way is, is, yeah, if you're a marketer out there, I mean, this is going to make a ton of sense to you because I've developed it completely. But my contention is that every business, um, I don't care what industry you're in, can develop this for their customers. Um, and so that's the that's my real long term goal for this is that that a lot of businesses start thinking this way, not just marketers. Hmm. Hey, John, this is, well, sorry, my audio glitched earlier. I had to reset it. <laughs> Got to love technology. But yeah. you talk about this idea in your book about customers as members. What yeah. exactly do you mean by that? Sure. So again, the, the there is probably some confusion with that term. It just made the most sense to me to use that. But I'm not talking about, first off, um, a subscription or a membership or even a community. Those are all great models. They all might make sense for certain businesses. But what I'm talking about more is, is, is the relationship. You know, in a customer relationship, 
things are quite often very transactional. Uh, whereas in a, a membership, if somebody joins something, they join an organization because they, uh, they, they actually want to invest in themselves or invest in that organization. Um, if, if they, um, they stay in that organization and, and maybe even refer, uh, you know, as a customer, we may refer folks, but as a, a member, you know, we're going to evangelize that organization. And I just think that it's, it's a way of looking at the relationship that you treat treat every, uh, everybody, every customer, every client that comes into your organization, if you treat them as though they were a member looking for a transformation, I think it's just going to color uh, everything that you do. It's going to color the, ultimately, it's going to color the products and services that I think you uh, offer to them as well. John, from the marketing execution implementation side of things, can you walk us through how someone would go about getting started uh, developing a customer success sure. track? Like, you know, walk us through the first couple of days or so. Yeah, I mean, obvi obviously, uh, the more you know your customers, the longer you've been doing this. Some of it might just be intuitive because you've experienced. You maybe haven't haven't uh, thought about you know stages and things, but you probably have a fairly good handle. But what I tell people quite often on this is, in my experience, most of the customers that you're serving, especially your ideal customers, and we'll get into that a little bit about narrowing maybe, but particularly your ideal customers, most of them come to you with a certain problem in a certain stage. And you get really good at serving that problem, that stage. You guys are all marketers. You know that, that most of the businesses that really turn to a marketing consultant who want a marketing system realize that they've got a lot of moving parts that aren't moving together. Their website's not doing much for them if they have one that, that you know full function they really don't have that much content their uh, search engine optimization is something that they abdicated to somebody and have no idea what they're getting for it and that's really com common stage i mean that's the stage that i've defined as foundational stage and you also know that you can't move people you can't start generating leads or sales for them unless you clean some of that up and so one of the first things to probably to do is to really define the stage that most of your customers come to you, most of your ideal customers come to you today. Um, and that from there, um, you can start then elevating, you know, how could we take them to the next level, whatever that is in your business. Now, I will also say that, that some businesses are somewhat transactional. There's no question if you're a professional service provider selling B2B, this probably makes a ton of sense right off the bat. But let's say you're a remodeling contractor and you're thinking, well, you know, people come to me because they want their kitchen remodeled. I still believe that you can develop the stages for even how a project is going to go and you could communicate that customer success track with the idea of the ultimate experience as well as the end product being developed. So I think it's just a matter of, of taking your individual business, looking at what is very common, what are the common characteristics of your ideal customers, uh, and then really start the, the, the hard work of figuring out how could, you actually, uh, how could you actually do what you do for them today in a much more advanced way. Hey, John, um, one of the questions that comes to mind is that uh, I, in, in your book, you talk about how concepts like the marketing funnel and the customer journey have limitations. How, how so? Well, the, the the marketing funnel I've been beating up on for years, you know, because unfortunately, uh, while there's there's an aspect of a funnel uh, generating clients, uh, most people that's where they stop thinking about it. It's like that ah, the person said they'd buy. That was the ultimate goal. Um, and really, to me, the ultimate goal is to have 100% of your clients so thrilled that they're referring you. And so the the customer journey and even a tool you guys have worked with quite a bit, the marketing hourglass, in some ways. Um, has its limitations, even though um, it focuses a great deal of emphasis on what happens after the sale. I mean, the best source of lead generation uh, is a happy customer. And so if you put that focus on the what happens when they buy, what happens, you know, uh, to, that makes them want to repeat what happens or how can you stimulate referrals? I think that is that I think we're miles ahead in that thinking. And, and of course, you know, the, the bookshelves today are, are littered with lots of books about, uh, you know, never lose a customer again and and uh, uh, talk triggers and uh, hug your customers and you know some of those kinds of books that are very focused on the idea of of the customer experience 
However, I think that in some ways that thinking can be limited because it's still, I mean, I, I, I map it out greatly. You know, our customer journey, the marketing hourglass appears <laughs> in the ultimate marketing engine. So I'm not saying that, suggesting that we go away from that, but I'm suggesting that that's still limited because in the end, we are still trying to guide the customer to do what we want them to do, <laughs> um, which is obviously the big goal of marketing, <laughs> you know, marketing a business. But what I'm going to suggest is that the customer success track becomes inserted inside of when somebody becomes a customer, becomes more of your ability to map the goals of, of taking that customer and creating a transformation in their life or in their business. And I just think that that puts a, a different focus on how we think about growing our own businesses. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a good lead into my question um, because you talk about, you know, the, the customer experience and, 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 you know, guiding them through the process. And a common mistake that I see all the time is, you know, when you, when you first start talking with a business about who are your ideal customers, they say anybody who has a checkbook, right. you know, or anything like that. But really, that's absolutely further from the truth. You know, I mean, yeah. nothing could be further from the truth than that. So, you know, in, in your book, you talk about really maybe even narrowing it to the top 20 clients that you have. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about why you recommend that? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I was talking to a, a bank uh, recently uh, that was just kind of trying to work on their marketing. And, you know, it was really just a casual conversation. I said, so who's your ideal customer? People who don't have money and pe or people who have money and people who need money. And I was like, OK, we're going to have to work on that a little bit. But that is that is very, very common uh, the way that people see it. I mean, if I'm an accountant, anybody who needs to get their taxes done is, is a prospect. But we all have experienced that customer that's really not a good fit. Yeah, they needed their taxes done, but they don't keep their, you know, they bring us a shoebox full of a bunch of receipts and have no idea what it is. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're not an ideal customer necessarily. But I think that, that you know, as cliche as it might sound, I mean, the, the whole 80-20 um, thing is, is real, or at least in my experience. Most businesses I've worked with, 80% of their profits come from their top 20%, not necessarily 20 as a number, but their top 20% of their customers. And, and the reason for that quite often is because that was the right customer. They had the right problem. They, they actually matched up with the value that you can bring. I mean, you, you, you guys, again, as marketing consultants, you've, you've probably experienced customers that come to you or prospects that come to you. They have, they have a budget, they have money, they have a great need. They want to build an integrated system. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're the, you you probably look at them and go, oh, we can help them and we can help them fast <laughs> because, you know, they have the right problem. And I think that that is true for most businesses if, if they go through and they look at their their ideal customers, because not everybody is ideal. You can't actually uh, you can't actually make every customer successful. So it's important that you choose uh, that that ideal customer, the one that's really suited or matched for exactly what you're trying to do. The other thing that I've experienced and why I say to really focus on that top 20 is because the, the opportunity cost of chasing all of this other business that really is maybe not that profitable, is not the right fit, is that it stops you from, from looking at that top 20% and, and, and asking yourself, what percentage of them would do 10 times more business with me if I actually had the right focus? What percentage or smaller percentage of that group would do 100 times more business with me if I made that the total focus of my business? And I think that that, um, that mindset or that point of view about narrowing your focus um, actually allows you to scale your business with your best customers as opposed to going out and chasing more customers. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I work with a lot of home services, home remodeling type contractors, and, you know, they always have like, you know, three or four core services that they want to offer. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, but it's like, where do I invest my marketing strategy and, and all that kind of stuff? And it's like, you know, you, you really should just pick the one that you're the strongest in, yeah. that you have the best reputation, that you have your best customers in, and double down on that, then try to you know, siphon off and, and and water down your your marketing messaging and your clarity of what what you're offering and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it's really interesting. I'm I'm really interested to dive more into that in 
as I learn more about uh, what, what all you've put together. Hey, you know, John, something I found interesting is that this is a book about marketing, but you don't talk about ways to create better websites and, or generate more leads until near the end of the book. What was the, uh, the idea behind that? Yeah. And I, and I do actually acknowledge that, that, you know, here you're in chapter eight or wherever it is. I'm finally going to talk about uh, marketing. Um, so I'm sure that some, I'm sure there will be some negative reviews <laughs> at some point. So I thought this was a marketing book. It's when I wrote the referral engine, I spent the first half of the book saying, you know, the way to get more referrals is to be more referable. Um, and of course, a lot of people were coming there to get hacks and, you know, things that they could do to trick people into referring them. Um, and it, it really, you know, you, you guys, I mean, have heard me say this a million times. I mean, this is a strategy before tactics book. And what I really wanted to, dr to drive home was that this idea of, you know, creating the customer success track, really narrowing your focus to your top 20%, and then focusing on telling them, or at least communicating the story that they're telling themselves, that messaging component, you know, that all has to be done before we start thinking about how do we use our website? All the work that done that, that we did in the first six chapters is now prepared us to actually create a website that is going to lead the customer journey, that is going to tell the right story, that's going to attract the more of that top 20% of your clientele. And so that's really why I waited to that point because in the end, this is a strategy book. Certainly, I had to uh, reveal the common tactics that many, many businesses use today and give you, you know, steps four and five are just loaded, in my opinion, with uh, lots of things that you can do to actually then stimulate and, and scale your business. But I really wanted to wait uh, be because uh, I wanted to spend as much possible time and energy and emphasis around this idea of strategy. Yeah, and that's, you know, something you alluded to in there, and, and I think it's forgotten a lot of times, is you have to have that foundation in place. That's right. You have to have that first. Yep. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that. They're like, give me the 23 things that I can do today because I don't want to do the 23 things you told me to do yesterday. <laughs> yep. There's, there's a, a, a point, I think, in uh, this book, I, I believe, where you say, uh, people don't want what you sell, which I know so the first time someone reads that, you and I both know they're going to be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What do you mean people don't want what I sell? Like, yeah. isn't that the whole point of marketing? Isn't this the ultimate marketing engine? Like, what yeah. are you getting at there? So um, why don't you speak a little bit to that? Oh, you bet. What you're getting at there. You bet. So you guys are all marketing strategists for the most part. And I guarantee you not a single one of your clients has ever woken up and said, I think I'm going to go get some marketing strategy today. Not a single one of them, I guarantee you, right? But they do wake up and they say, how come every time the phone rings, they're asking for a lower price? Or how come my competitors are showing up in the map pack or the three pack and I'm not? I mean, those are the things that, that are keeping them awake at, life, uh, at night. And so what I, I, you know, to finish that statement, nobody wants what we sell. They want their problems solved, period. And the point of that is that, that if all we're communicating is, you know, here's our solution and they haven't connected our solution to the problem they're trying to solve, then we have a much harder job. But if we first communicate, I get you, I know what you're struggling with. You know, a lot of our clients, the uh, people that you guys uh, attract, they're struggling with control of what's going on. They're struggling with confidence of what to do next. Uh, they're, they're struggling with you know, clarity of, uh, of what their message should be. And if we can help them understand that that's their biggest challenge, then we can start talking about, oh, by the way, marketing strategy of a website that communicates you know, you, how you're different. Those are the <laughs> solutions now that are going to solve those biggest problems that you have. And I, I, you know, our clients, our prospects get to define the problem they're trying to solve in many cases. I mean, people make purchases of luxury goods and things, for example, not because they don't have a car uh, that, that runs, but they do it because of what it what it means, you know, for them, what what they get, you know, out of making that purchase. And so I think you could take this idea to really any type of product or service. We have to we have to connect with that. And, and obviously, um, you know, many, many, many people 
are out there expressing what their pro the problem they're getting solved uh, by our businesses, and yet we're, we're not paying attention. We're still talking about features and benefits and how long we've been in business and how big we are, as opposed to really focusing on what they care uh, about, which are usually the little, the little things that they're not getting in their everyday life. Hmm. John, uh, the notion of storytelling and marketing is, you know, pretty standard advice in the last few years, but you introdu introduced the idea of narrative yeah. versus storytelling. So can you explain sure, that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So maybe I may need to define the distinction uh, for folks, but you're right. Storytelling is like, you know, it's the, it's the hot thing that even though it's been around for, you know, a hundred years, but uh, you'd think every marketer in the last five years is who created the idea of storytelling. Um, and there's no question that telling stories, showing uh, your 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 softer side, I mean, letting people know who you really are, there's, there's tons of benefits from that. But again, a lot of what people do in storytelling is, is they tell their story <laughs> and they tell it in a very linear fashion that, you know, hopefully moves somebody uh, along. And uh, the, the difference between narrative is it's how the story is broken up and told. We've all seen examples of the movie where you know, it starts close shot on a car chase <laughs> going through a city. There's no subtext, nothing. It's just like this is happening all of a sudden. And then, you know, the car wrecks and crashes into something cut away to the main character in seventh grade. And it's, you know, it's like, wait, that was the ending of the story that sucked me in, you know, to the story. And now you're going to fill in the blanks. Now you're going to develop the character. Now I'm going to understand, you know, what's going to lead to that. And I think that's the idea behind narrative is that it is uh, it gives people the ability to tell the story, to experience the story in a way that's more dramatic than simply just going through. First, we started the business 10 years ago and then we, you know, which so many people do, there's just no drama in that. There's no impact in that. And nobody, nobody, uh, it's very hard to suck somebody into that story. And so narrative really does start with a lot more of, or, or the concept of narrative starts with the idea of cutting the story up in a way that, that's going to allow you to give the most dramatic punch, you know, right in the beginning. Uh, because that's that what people are suffering from the problem they're trying to solve the emotions around what they're trying to do you know that's what we have to connect with and i think that the idea of narrative storytelling uh, gives us that ability that's very interesting it sounds like a tarantino film so we're supposed to embrace our inner tarantino <laughs> i guess that, right that's right well, or, it, it definitely sounds like it's it in a good way that it's less formulaic which is nice right. like i if there's one thing that i personally can't stand it's the storytelling that says first you have to do this then right. you have to do this then you have to do it's not a recipe it, everybody's yeah. different so this well and, sounds and like it allows and, you and to that's yeah and the great point is, I mean, if, if we all went to a movie and watched that movie, we would all come out, even if we all love that movie, we would love it for different reasons. And, and I think that that's kind of what, what our customers and prospects uh, do is, you know, the customer journey, it's nice to say they go to this stage and then in this stage and this stage, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, people come with, you know, so many different avenues and so many different things they're trying to do. They're different. They're in different stages of life. And so I think that, that it does have to be a little more Lego-ish, if you will, uh, to allow people to tell themselves the story um, that, that that you're putting out there. And it sounds like you're almost starting with the transformation, presenting what they could look like, yeah. at least in your analogy of the movie, yeah. right? Where it yeah. shows you yeah. this is what happened. Um, you suggest that content is no longer a tactic, but uh, when it's used correctly, it's the voice of strategy. Um, you know, how should a business use content? Yeah. Well, so it, it's, you know, I, you, a couple of years ago, I was saying content is there. You know, 10 years ago, we were saying content's king. That was the marketers, you know, then I moved to air because frankly, you really can't anymore. It's very difficult to do much in the world of marketing, you know, without content. And that's even if your transactions are done right across the desk, people start their journey, they research, you know, they need sales materials. I mean, it's all really content, video, email, social posting. If we all put that in the bucket of content, then then you pretty quickly come to realize that you, you can't move the needle much without a focus on content. But unfortunately, what that's done for a lot of people is just, you know, opened up the dump truck. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's just, okay, we're got to have content. Let's just go pay people to write a bunch of content. And, and what I'm trying to get people to do is say, look, you can actually do less 
if you have a strategic uh, approach to it. So when we develop what problem we solve or what our core point of difference is, a lot of our content focus needs to be on telling that story, expanding that story, understanding that people need to hear different things in know and in like and in trust and in try and in buy and repeat and refer. They need different content because they have different questions and different objectives as they move through those stages. And so if we just build that framework for our content, as opposed to just saying, well, it's Monday, I got a blog again, um, it's going to be much more effective for us. And so in, in that point of view, it becomes becomes the voice of telling strategy. Strategy, it's not enough to have a clever saying that becomes your core message and goes on the, you know, above the fold on your website and goes on your business cards. You, you want to take that, the fact that you develop that core strategy and really build content and story around it. Awesome. Yeah. And, and can I ask one more question? I don't know, Ian. Are, are you out of your question uh, tokens there? Or, uh... oh, yeah, I, I might be, actually. But uh, <laughs> if the panel cuts me off, I know I am. Um, one, of, one of the things that comes to mind is that um, what we found as, as certified duct tape marketing consultants is that um, pe often people that come to us, they're already sold on the idea of strategy first, or they think they need that. Um, but once they get into it, they're like, I can't do all this. It, it's too complicated. When when I saw um, that you were bringing out this book and, and as we've talked more, the one question that occurs to me as a marketing consultant and for my clients and prospects is once they read this, is it the type of book that kind of is guide enough that they won't need help from a consultant or does it kind of get them so far and then they're like, I need help? This is too many pieces again, but it gives me the structure to understand what we're doing. I mean, I suppose there will be the occasional superhuman freak that can read this book and will actually do what's in it. But uh, that will be such a small number uh, that uh, I think there will always need somebody who, let's face it, an outside perspective is valuable. Accountability is is valuable because that's that's the biggest challenge they'll have is nobody's knocking on their door saying, did we do this? You know, did we move this forward? So, you know, at the very least, those are going to be components, but also as we know, there are a lot of tactical things in this that they shouldn't do. Um, there, you can't abdicate strategy, but you should, as a mar or as a business owner, be delegating a great deal of what is done in the name of marketing for your business. Once you have a plan, or once you have confidence in somebody who's actually going to be able to deliver on that plan, uh, so I think that. Uh, uh, I, I think that, as I said, there may be some people that take this and, and run with it. But I think the, the real goal of this as a marketing consultant uh, would be that somebody understand this enough to actually be a better buyer of your services. That's awesome. And nice to know that there's still some job stability for, you know, the people on this panel. Thanks, John. Uh, you, you guys are all so brilliant. I can't imagine uh, that uh, there won't be uh, there, there. There's a continuous stream of folks knocking on your doors. You know? <laughs> Partly because the need for what we do is so huge as well, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and we're in a period of transformation just in terms of the way people are thinking about executing their business, the way people are now buying and they're buying differently. You know, and, and it's really I mean, it sounds to me like this is a very timely book. It's not about COVID, but it's but but we are in a situation where yeah. There is transformation in the way that we're thinking about buying and the way that um, we need to deliver products and services differently than maybe we ever have before. Yeah. And, and I think we're, who knows when the window will close, but I think we're in a very wide open window now where people are considering uh, change like never before um, yeah. because of you know what, what kind of happened over the last year. So, I mean, I think you've got a lot of of opportunity right now to uh, to explore some new avenues and to, and to innovate in the way that you're delivering what you're delivering. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I think that that you know that's uh, that's a great opportunity for many businesses. You know, and and if they're smart, they're going to seize the opportunity. I, unfortunately, I think a lot of businesses, you know, they're either so stressed, you know, because of what's been happening, or they're so challenged because they're so busy. Yeah. You know, that, um, you know, we really need to find a way to help them leverage, you know, the great ideas and concepts that you're putting forward with this book.
Well, and, and, and some of, you know, some of what you can do with uh, your marketing uh, skills is helping find people too. Yep. I mean, that's, uh, that's yeah. the, that's the new problem, <laughs> is, yeah, is especially skilled labor shortages. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to just open it up to the panel and let you guys um, see if you have any other questions for John. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in here, something you said a little bit earlier, Ken, and Ian's question and about the marketing funnel being kind of limiting and the good thing is it's a good way to conceptualize and visualize that customer journey, but in the real world, it's a convoluted mess. And do you think that has gotten even worse now with all these different channels? Well, I think there's no question it's gotten more complex for people. I don't think it has to be. Uh, I mean, I think that your guys' job probably uh, uh, could move to to uh, to tell them what they don't need to do uh, in some cases. But uh, um, you know, the reason I've picked on the marketing funnel is not because it's not an effective first half of of uh, you know marketing. It's just when people don't think about it as a, a you know, a part of a greater whole, uh, then I think it's very limiting. And and they just, you know, once they get the order, it's like, I don't have to do anything else. And I think that that's, uh, that's not every business, but I think a lot of people that really had that funnel mentality, that's really it. It's like, get the sale. Um, and so it's, to me, it's, it's sort of short uh, term thinking. I think also, if you think about the stages of, you know, consideration, you know, awareness, uh, um, trial or the, you know, some of the things that have always been used, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's all about demand creation and demand like shoving <laughs> in a way. And I think that where we are today and why I've you know chosen uh, the very specific words for the marketing hourglass in journey uh, is that I, I think it's less about creating demand and more about organizing behavior. And that's what those stages are meant to be sort of behavior behavioral uh, aspects that I think we as consumers, you can use your own example, uh, want to go uh, through with uh, co the companies we do business with. And I think that that's, uh, that's so it's, it's somewhat semantics, it's somewhat, but it's, but it's mostly just a point of view about helping a customer achieve their goals as opposed to just trying to cram something down their throat. One question I think I would have about um, uh, directing the customer actually directing the, the client I, probably more is um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I've more than once and it's just been this year more than any other year. I don't know why I get in with a client and it seems like, well, we have a marketing problem. And then you get in and you're like, this is sort of a marketing problem and sort of a sales problem and sort of a customer service problem and sort of a leadership problem. What kind of advice do you have when it's regardless of whether we're marketing, sales, whatever we are, to use this, you know, the tools that you have in this book to really identify these challenges sooner? Uh, because sometimes I think the danger that happens with all of us is we get maybe two or three months into a relationship and we don't realize that, whoa. I don't think I have the tools in my toolbox right now to solve this, but I do know some people who do. Yeah. How can this book kind of help identify some of those things earlier on? Well, I think that uh, a concept that that certainly is in this book, but is one that you guys are familiar with because I've been working on it for years. I, I, I've i used uh, time and time again, very early on, even in the, uh, frankly, I've used it a time or two in the discovery phase before somebody became a client, introducing the marketing hourglass and, and just kind of talking through the idea of what might go in those stages that they have those stages. Um, but, uh, you know, if you think about no like and trust, I mean, that's marketing. Uh, try and buy a sales uh, repeat and refer is is service in a lot of ways. So you can start having that kind of umbrella conversation and depending upon, you know, the players involved or, or you know, what the business is, where the business is today. Um, that's a very uh, easy way to start identifying. Oh, well, we never thought about that. Or, no, we don't have anything for that, for that. So you start seeing the gaps, and they're always in the customer experience. I mean, they're always after the sale or where the where the massive gaps are, and of course they have nothing you know in place for referral. So I think it, it positions you as a strategist to start 
that start that conversation with them. And maybe just maybe uh, the problem is so, so, uh, so big that, um, that, that you can't solve it. But I think that it does allow you to start interjecting yourself in the, in the conversation that says, you know, no matter how great our marketing is, if you're, if one's going out the back door, every time one comes in the front door, you know, we're not going to make any progress. So set the expectations, you know, at, at that level uh, before you go into an agreement. And if you don't know where your operational gaps are, just hire a sales and marketing consultant and they will produce so much business for you that all of a sudden your operational uh, you know, gaps will suddenly <laughs> appear to you. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll just make it up on volume. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, John, thanks so much. Oh, yeah. um, I'm really excited to, uh, you know, to get this book and dig more into it. Um, now you have a pre-launch companion course with six video lessons and some worksheets uh, on the core topics. It, 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 my understanding is that that's free for anybody who pre pre-orders the book. Is that correct? Yeah. If you, if you just visit the ultimate marketing engine.com, the website for the book, you'll see something that says, get the companion course, click on that. It'll give you the instructions on, you know, you can pre-order the book anywhere. Then uh, you come back and there'll be a little form you can fill out and that'll give you access to the, uh, the course. And it is, it is six videos, but I've also created and, and, uh, um, you know, have a host of, of materials, worksheets and things that uh, can help people work through the book as well. So you'll get a sampling of a few of those. And so if you're listening to this uh, before September 21st of 2021, uh, then uh, go pre-order the book now and uh, and you can start consuming some of the content right away. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then also, how can people find out more about you, your books sure. and also the duct tape marketing? Consultant? Well, you can pretty much figure out everything I've been doing for the last couple of decades at uh, ducttapemarketing.com. So it's D-U-C-T-T-A-P-E marketing.com. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, John. Um, look forward to seeing you in person here one of these days soon. Gosh, and, uh, don't we all. I'm excited <laughs> that uh, you're our first uh, repeat guest. That's pretty awesome. So thank you so much for your time and really enjoyed it. Well, my pleasure. Great seeing you guys. All right. Great Thanks. seeing you. Take care. Bye.